Amen, amen. Thank you, band. Man, it, it feels good to be in the room tonight. Uh, it's the last night of our series called Rooted. And I've got to say, before we even get into the text tonight, this series, have y'all enjoyed this series? Uh, I mean, like, like, honestly, this has been one of, I think, the best series that I've ever been a part of in student ministry in my tenure doing it. Uh, this series has been challenging, it's been convicting, it's been life-giving in its own way, and every Wednesday night we've had students down here, down front, praying, seeking Jesus, and that's incredible. Uh, again, last week, if you missed it, we had six students get baptized and follow Jesus in that. Can we still make some noise for that? Man, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, I will never, ever get tired of talking about life-changing students. It's amazing, uh, because I was one of you. I was in your seat 10, 11 years ago, 10 years ago, and I was struggling with the fact of what am I gonna do with my life? I did not know the direction I was going and my student pastor loved me and cared for me and poured into me and, and preached and, and was faithful in that. And because of his faithfulness in his area of ministry, I'm now doing what I'm doing, all because he challenged me to root myself in the word of God and follow and pursue Jesus with all that I have. And if you don't hear anything else tonight, I want you to know that it is our desire for all of you in this room that are watching later, that are in and out of this room week in and week out to experience Jesus in a real tangible way in your life. That's our desire, is that we want to create a space for you and for your friends to come into a place that you can experience Jesus. And I think that God is, is faithful in that. And we've seen him move in the last few weeks and it's been awesome. But tonight we're in Colossians chapter four. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and get them open. Bible app's cool in here. It'll be on the screen if you don't have it. But I want us to see kind of something that's really cool that happens when we plan these series out and it's unintentional on our part. It's just how God works is that if you go all the way back to January, who was here on our first Wednesday night this, this past year? Anybody here on the first Wednesday night? And we, we talked about our theme for 2021 being all in, all out, that we were going to go all in with our relationships with Jesus to then live all out for our communities to experience Jesus. And in that series, we looked at a verse from Colossians, which is so funny how God does that, that we fast forward five months later and we're still talking about this verse from Colossians. It's found in Colossians chapter three. If you don't know it, it's verses 16 and 17, and it says this. Paul is writing in this book, and he says, let the message about Christ and in all its richness fill your life. Teach and counsel each other with the wisdom he gives. Sing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. But we focus on verse 17 more than anything, and it says that whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And we built our entire semester off of that one verse. And it's so cool to see how God is faithful to take us down this path together of growing and learning what it looks like to root our life off of him because of the vision he gave us for this year. And it's incredible. And tonight we're gonna finish up this series and we're talking about one word called prayer. Everybody say prayer. And prayer is something that we as a church value. It's actually in our values as a church is that we are building ourselves as a church on the root of prayer because in order for us to be the church, we have to first be in touch with the one who created the church. And for us to be able to be representatives of Jesus, we first have to talk to Jesus himself. And tonight we're gonna see that, but I've got a question for you in the room. What does your prayer life look like? <clears throat> straight up, straight out the gate. If you had to rate it, would it be a one or a five? And I'm gonna give you a little key to help. One is that the only time you ever pray is over food, and it's only sometimes. That the whole bless the meat, let's eat prayer, like that's you. Or a five is that you're faithful to carve out time every day to pray, not just for yourself, but for your friends and your family, for your church, maybe your dog, uh, you know, may, maybe your final that you're about to bomb and you're sitting at the desk. Uh, that was me in high school. I was a terrible student. But maybe, just maybe you're a five. Or maybe you're a three. Maybe you pray sometimes, but then a lot of times you're really busy and you don't really think to pray. 
Or maybe you're a two and you just, man, nah, it's kind of there. And then a four, you're, you're better than you were. I mean, we can all be on that scale somewhere and it's okay. Because I want us to see the basis of scripture tonight is that it's pointing us back to what Paul said is the root of the Christian life. Not just the word, not just the, the life-giving message of the gospel, but the fact that we can communicate with God the creator as somebody who he created, that we can have a relationship with Jesus. We pick up in Colossians chapter four, we're in verses two through six, and Paul says this. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, or continue all the time in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Verse three, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. So Paul is asking that not only would we pray just for God to use us, but that we would pray for God to use fellow believers because in this time, Paul was in prison for preaching the gospel. Paul was in Rome. He was in a jail cell in chains, couldn't leave, getting fed old stale bread and water. And he writes this message to the church, asking the church to pray for him. Asking the church to pray for those that are preaching the gospel. Asking the church to pray for all people who claim to be believers in Jesus. And then he continues on. He says, I want you to pray for me in verse four that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. That I walk in wisdom towards outsiders. That I make the best use of the time. And then he encourages the church and he says, let your speech always be gracious. Season with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And in this four-verse passage, Paul gives us the basis of the Christian life. If you're taking notes tonight, we're going to have three truths. We're going to try to get through these together. Uh, truth one is that prayer should always be consistent and constant. Straight up, prayer should always be something in your life that is consistently done and that is constant every day. Because when you think about prayer, prayer is literally just a conversation with you and God. Prayer is not this grand speech that you have to give in front of five million people. It's literally you talking to God who created you about the things going on in your life. It's you having a conversation like I'm talking with you right now just with the creator of the universe. Prayer is talking. It doesn't require experience. It doesn't require perfection. Prayer is simply a conversation. But to be consistent and to be constant, it takes effort. You have to willingly take time in your day to sit down and pray. Now, I know that a lot of you in the room, you're probably like, man, I'm so rushed in the mornings to get to school, I barely have time to breathe. A lot of you, I know you've got busy schedules and these things, and I want you to understand that the whole consistent and constant part doesn't have to just be a 10-hour prayer time in your closet in your bedroom but it's a daily conversation that you're having with God all throughout the day. You're praying for things. You're asking God for wisdom. You're asking Jesus to give you direction. I can tell you that I pray more in my truck because people don't know how to drive than I do anywhere else. You know what I'm saying? Anybody here drive that just hates drivers? Like I pray that Jesus would not let them wreck, but that their tire would get flat. You know what I mean? Like they make me mad. Like, Ugh! But I pray all the time in my truck because I drive a lot. I'm constantly on the go. I pray a lot whenever I'm in my office and I'm actually paid to pray, it's kind of weird. But my job is to be spiritual, but sometimes I'm not all that spiritual. Sometimes I get busy, sometimes I forget to pray. And the challenge from scripture that we see, Paul says that continue steadfastly, continue earnestly, another translation says, to make an effort to pray because that's what we're called to do. Because prayer is a consistent and constant thing in our life. I mean, if you look back through the gospels, Jesus took time to separate himself from people he was ministering to, to go pray. Jesus, the, the Bible says, withdrew. It'll use that word. Or it'll say he went away. Jesus himself, God in flesh, the savior of the world, had to take time to pray and to talk to Father God because that is the calling of the Christian life. To not only root ourselves in the truth of God's word, but to have a growing and living and active relationship with him. And the only way to do that is through prayer. Now, I know some of you in the room too, like you're the desperate prayers. I was one of those that anytime anything goes wrong, oh God, help 
help me. Oh, God, help me. And you just cry out like you've never cried out before. That was literally me when I was taking my driving test. I thought I was going to fail it. Like, that was me. That was me whenever the slightest inconvenience happened or when that girl in high school broke my heart. Oh, my God, help me. That's some of you in the room. That the only time you pray is when bad stuff happens. Some of you only pray and thank God when good stuff happens. Some of you never pray. And I want you to know that tonight I want to challenge us to understand that that's okay, but we're going to fix that. Because I want you to see that time with Jesus is never wasted time. That when you spend time reading the word and when you spend time in prayer and when you spend time in worship, when you spend time with other believers and you're talking about what God's doing in your life, that is not a waste of time or boring. At least it shouldn't be. Because that is the basis of the believer's life. And something my commentary said as I was studying, it says the connection here that Paul says about giving thanksgiving, watching and being attentive to what you're praying for and then seasoning your speech, it says that the connection here may suggest the threefold rhythm, that there's a rhythm to the Christian life, that you intercede and pray for other people, just like Paul asked the church to pray for him. You watch for answered prayers, that what you prayed for happens, you watch it, and when it does happen, you're thankful for it. It's very easy. You pray for people, you wait to see the prayer answered, and when it's answered, you give God praise. Because it's, it, it's so funny how scripture supports itself. If you flip over to the next book in the Bible, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul is writing another letter to the church in Thessalonica and he literally says these three verses. It says, rejoice always, verse 16 through 18 in chapter five. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing or never stop praying. Give thanks in all circumstances. Everybody say all. He doesn't say some. He doesn't say when it's good. He doesn't say when everything's okay. He says all circumstances give thanks because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And the you right there is the church that he's writing to and that's us. That our job as believers in Christ, our calling as a believer in Jesus is to spend time in prayer with God every day. It's to spend time consistently coming back to the place that God speaks to you the most. Mine's my truck. Maybe for you, it's your bedroom. Maybe it's your closet. Maybe it's your car. Maybe it's your back deck. Maybe it's sitting there hugging and loving on your dog. Maybe it is at the dinner table. Maybe it's in your bedroom in front of your TV. Every one of us have a place that we love to be that God speaks to us. And my challenge to you that what we see in Jesus's life is to find that place if you don't have that place and make a consistent and constant effort to go there once a day, even if it's for a minute. Because the, the beginning step of going forward of progress is the first step. And that tonight, prayer should be constant and consistent in your life. But then we skip on down to what Paul says in this verse. And he says that I may make it clear in verse four which I ought to speak he says, I pray in verse three that, that God may open to us a door for the word. That's for the gospel to go out. He said, I pray that God would give me a door to share with someone who doesn't know him. And truth too tonight is that prayer creates opportunities. Prayer literally creates opportunities. I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a quick story. I was in Somerset, my hometown, and Again, this is a story of me and Corey, my best friend. We'd walk around downtown late at night every night and just evangelize and talk to people about Jesus. But literally, we're walking one night, and I had some garbage in my hand, and I saw this guy sitting over there on a, a, a bench, and I'm like, bro, I'm not about to walk up to this dude wearing black. He's going to stab me, and I'm going to get killed. Not happening. And Corey said, why don't you pray about it, being kind of snarky. And I was like, hey, you're funny. And he was like, no, seriously, pray about it. I said, all right, so... We're driving around downtown and we get out and we walk and we're walking up to him and we're getting close and I have this bag of garbage and I'm just praying like, God, if you want me to speak to him, just tell me, just tell me. I'm gonna go up here and act like I'm throwing this garbage away and just kind of scope out the situation, make sure there's no weapon. So I walk up behind him, I'm still praying. I'm like, God, if this is how you want it to be, like if I'm going out this way, at least let me tell him the gospel before he shoots me. Like I'm, I'm thinking of all these things and I have the garbage and I drop it in the bag and I walk off and he said, hey. And I said, shoot. I knew, I was like, dang it, God, I know it. I gotta talk to him. 
And I turn around, I'm like, hey man, what's your name? We talk and I sit down. I'm literally sitting in downtown Somerset at like 3 a.m. It's dark, he's in all black. It's starting to kind of rain. But I'll tell you this, is that I literally sat on that bench for an hour and I listened to this man's story and I talked to him about the goodness of the gospel. He was 17 years old, had just gotten kicked out of his house. He was on meth and he was hooked on pills. His parents kicked him out. They said, you're done. I want you out of my life, out of, out of our house. We don't want anything to do with you anymore. And a man that I had never met, ever, cried on my shoulder in the middle of the morning in downtown Somerset, and I got to talk to him about the goodness of God and lead him to Christ. All because I prayed, God opened a door for me tonight with this young man. Now, that's not always gonna happen. I'm not some super spiritual person that like God just listens to me and opens doors, but prayer works because I want you to see in this room that you all are a byproduct of prayer. That before you even were born, there were people praying for you. There's people that are praying for you right now that you will never meet in your entire life because they love you and care about you and they take their calling as a believer seriously. And you look in Matthew, you look in this little verse that Jesus is teaching about God sending people out and he says, pray, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. Ask is pray, pray to me to send people out to go advance the gospel. Pray to me for God to give my people boldness. Pray for, for us as a church to go out and actually live our life the way we're called to live it. Because so many of us in the room, we don't spend time in prayer praying for our friends and we wonder why they're still lost. It's because God's wanting to use us, but he's wanting to speak to us through prayer because prayer is the starting point for the mission. You can't know the direction you're going unless you first talk to the commander, right? You can't know the direction you're heading unless there's road signs, right? You don't know what's gonna be on the test unless you read the study guide sometimes, right? How do we expect to go out and impact the world for the gospel if we don't spend time talking to Jesus? How can we come in here and worship him for who he is and how good he is if we're not spending time with him and letting him pour himself into us? How can we be gospel givers and life givers if we're not spending time in the word that gives life? It's questions like that that keep me up at night. Because honestly, at points I ask, is it even worth it? Do people care? Because all the time we see people in the church, we see church members and we see teenagers and we see young believers that just don't care about anything that we're doing. But it doesn't stop the faithfulness of it because we know we're called to it. And at some point, God's gonna do something. We just have to believe for it. It's like, Charles Stanley, Dr. Charles Stanley, who just retired from the ministry, said this quote. He said, the amount of time we spend with Jesus meditating on his word and his majesty and seeking his face then establishes our fruitfulness in the kingdom. The amount of time that we spend with Jesus gives us the greater impact that we can have because you cannot do what we're called to do on your own. You have to pray. You have to spend time with the Lord. It's like I look at the last few days of Jesus' life. He spent more time praying than he did speaking. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed all through the night and he was praying so hard he started sweating blood. And the disciples just fell asleep. He said, stay awake and pray, watch out. I'm gonna go over here and I'll come back. And after hours of agonizing prayer, knowing that he's about to take the cross for us, he comes back and his disciples were asleep. Is that you tonight? Are you the one that has fallen asleep in your spiritual life? Does this not even matter anymore? Is it a social status, a checkbox you do, or does it really mean something? Because that's a question I ask myself all the time. Is that, is it worth it? And I can tell you a thousand times over, yes. Because the things I've seen God do in the lives of you all in the last two years and in the ministry that I've been blessed to be a part of and in the things I've been able to do, not me on my power, but God by his, I know that all of this is worth it because in the end, God's gonna do something. And I believe it and I'm for it and I pray for it. And I ask you, are you praying the same thing? Are you praying for opportunities to share the gospel? 
Are you spending time with the Lord in, in prayer? Are you spending time in the word? Because the last thing I want us to see is that prayer keeps us rooted. The whole theme of this series is rooting ourselves and our life on the truth of God's word. And if it says it, we believe it. If the, the scripture talks about it, we talk about it. If Jesus said it and it's in red letters, it must mean something because it's in a different colored letter than it is in all of scripture. And when it keeps us rooted, Paul talks about, he says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders. Be an example to every person that you encounter. He says, make the best use of your time. Let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And the only two things that I can draw from this scripture is the fact that the more time you spend with Jesus, the more you look like Jesus. And the second thing is that there's a world outside of our four walls waiting for us to be the church we claim to be. Waiting for us to actually live the life we say we live. Waiting for us to reach out and give a handout and not spew judgment and hatred and say, blah, get away from me, I don't associate with you. But to walk into somebody's mess and say, here's the hope of the gospel. Because when you pray for that, when you honestly ask Jesus to open a door, he's gonna open it. But the question remains is, are you gonna walk through it? Because we can pray all day long. We can say, God, use this. God, send me. God, take me. God, do this. God, do that. But if we're not willing to say we trust you enough and your word enough to live it out, are we just babbling? Are we just spewing words that don't matter? Because I want us to see that prayer is the root of everything. That some of you are alive by the grace of God because someone prayed for you that you have a heartbeat right now because someone interceded for you and prayed for you as you were in the womb. You are here right now, not by accident, but because people are praying for you to encounter Jesus in a real way right now. And I ask you, are you doing the same? Are you praying for your friends? Are you praying for your community? Are you praying for God to open doors? Are you praying for your brother and sister that you can't stand? Are you praying that Jesus becomes real to them? Maybe, just maybe, are you praying for him to become real to you? Because tonight, Paul says, I want you to earnestly, steadfastly, watchfully, and thankfully pray. Because it matters. And it's powerful. And I talked to one of my mentors today. As Josh comes up, we're closing down. It's, he's a prayer warrior. He's actually the former pastor of the church, uh, Brother Gary Swaggerty. And he, he spoke a couple, or not a couple, a while back and I meet with him every week, bi-weekly if I can, and he just pours wisdom into me. And he's a prayer warrior. He said, my ministry is moved from preaching the gospel to praying for those that are preaching the gospel. He said, I've moved my life into a season of prayer. And I can tell you that this man, every single morning, without doubt, without missing a beat, gets out of his bed, brushes his teeth, and goes in his living room with a cup of coffee and he reads the word and he prays for about an hour. Every day, and he's done it for the last 30, 40 years. And today I asked him, I said, what's one thing that you as an older generational leader would give to our students tonight about prayer? And he said this quote, he said that prayer's purpose is not for us to change the mind of God, but for God to change our mind. That when we go to God in prayer with an agenda, and we go and we say, God, I need this, 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 and this. God, do this, 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 and this, like we always do. We go to God when we need him. We don't go to God when we want to. It's only when we have to. He says, prayer's purpose is not to change his mind, but to change ours. Because when we pray and we seek the Lord and we say, God, I'm bowing myself in a posture of prayer that I don't matter here that my plans don't matter, that what I want doesn't matter, but what you want matters most. It's funny how God always changes us and we do something totally different than when we started when we prayed. Jesus, I can imagine, I've, I've been to the place that he knelt down and prayed. I've been to Israel. I've went by the same garden of Gethsemane that he was in and we prayed. And it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do because I couldn't focus on anything else other than the fact that Jesus prayed for me in this very spot. 
and he prayed for you in that very spot. All of mankind was on his heart that night because he knew the next day he was dying for us. And still yet he chose to pray. Tonight, I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know where you are in your prayer life. I don't know if you ever even spend time in the word, if you haven't opened the Bible in months. Tonight, I challenge you, just do it. Because there is nothing more impactful, nothing greater than actually taking a moment out of your day. You're not that busy. To say, God, you're worth my time. God, use me today. God, open a door. God, bless my friends. God, let me speak life to somebody. Because if you're not praying for them, who is? And in the room, I, can, I feel a little bit of tension because a lot of you in here are feeling a little guilty because maybe that's not you. And tonight, I'm, I'm gonna ask us to do something different during response. The band's already up here and they're ready to lead. Something we're gonna do is we're gonna spend some time in prayer. I'm not talking like, God, thank you for today. God, bless our nachos tonight. God, my cat's sick, help him. I've gotta go see my girlfriend, help me talk to her. None of that. But to pray specifically tonight for each other in the room. And how we're gonna do this is a little different. It's gonna be a little awkward. It's gonna be pushing your comfort zone a little bit is that we're gonna get into what we call prayer triangles. It's where three people get together in the shape of a triangle and you hold shoulders and you pray. And each person prays for each person in the group. And it's not like a God bless them in Jesus name, amen, keep going. This is a, hey, I want to just take a moment, a minute, 30 seconds to pray for you out loud because I care about you. And I can already see some of you squirming like, I don't pray out loud, I don't do that, bro. Tonight I'm asking, would you step out of your comfort zone and do it? Because the real question remains is that if we can't pray for each other in a safe place like this, how can we ever expect to reach somebody out there in a world like we're going to? And tonight I challenge you. Prayer, it's worth it. Prayer, it matters. Prayer is the root to the Christian life. And I want us in the room to understand that we're not called to just come in here and sit and go have fun and do nothing with our life. But there's so much at stake for this generation right now. Your friends are dying a spiritual death. Your friends are on their way to hell right now. And you can stop that. Would you start praying for them?